Hi everyone, I'm Robbie Bieber and welcome to my Collodion Basics series. The goal of this series is going to be to take you from the perspective of an absolute beginner with no experience in the wet plate process and bring you up through all the basics that you'll need to know to begin successfully pouring and developing and finishing your first tin type photos. Now to begin with, let's start by defining some terminology. If you're not familiar with the process, the, the kind of array of terms used to describe wet plate photos can be a little bit confusing. You may have heard of collodion, wet plate, wet plate collodion, tin types, amber types, glass negatives, uh, even ferrotypes or alumatypes. So it's not necessarily obvious to an outsider how all these terms tie together. To begin with, the broad umbrella name for the process that we're going to be learning is the wet plate collodion process. It may also be called the wet plate process or just the collodion process for shorthand. Either one works. Now all these other terms that we have to describe the images that it produces owe to the fact that it's a somewhat flexible process. By varying the surfaces that you pour the collodion onto and slightly tweaking the techniques as you go through the process, uh, you can create a somewhat broad array of different types of images using the wet plate process. So to begin with, we have tin types. Tin types are kind of the public face of the wet plate process. Uh, if you pick a random person off the street, if they're familiar with any of these types of images, it's probably the tin type. These were super popular in the 19th century because they're fairly cheap, fairly rugged, and they produce a direct positive that you can just take with you very quickly. Tintype is what we call any collodion positive image on a metal backing. So these vintage examples were typically on steel or iron or whatever thin metal stock was available. And it's just coated in black Japan and baked before an image is exposed on it. Now, in modern times, we usually make tin types out of trophy aluminum. So this is an example of a modern plate. This is an 8x10, and if you look at the back of it, you'll see bare aluminum. So if you've ever had a trophy or a plaque with your name engraved on it, the nameplate was probably made out of the same material that we use nowadays for tin types. Um, it's much thicker than the vintage examples, and it's much easier to work with, which is the reason that it's so popular nowadays. Um, whereas an original style tin type, you would have to coat and bake yourself before you could use it. The trophy aluminum comes all nice and prepared from the factory with a plastic wrapper on the front protecting it. You just peel that wrapper off and you can use it right away. Now, some people like to distinguish between the two types of images by referring to an image on iron or steel plate as a ferrotype, and an image on an aluminum plate as an alumatype. I think these distinctions are a little bit superfluous. You know, in practice, uh, tin types have never been made on tin, or they may have been, but they were not commonly made on tin. Tin was just the term used at the time to describe any cheap metal. Uh, so tin types have historically been made on different types of metals. I don't think it's unreasonable to call an image made on modern aluminum a tin type. But if you hear the word ferrotype used, it's probably referring to an iron or steel plate tin type. If you hear the word alumatype used, they're referring to a tin type on aluminum. <coughs> now, the kind of counterpart to the tin type is the amber type. An amber type is exactly the same thing as a tin type except instead of being exposed on a metal plate, the image is exposed on a clear or colored glass plate. So this is not a great example of an amber type, but this is an amber type. Amber types are still positive images. Um, you could potentially print from them using modern processes, but they weren't really printable during the time that they were popular. The way that they're meant to be displayed or used is by placing a black background behind them, which makes the positive image come out. Um, the black background in that case plays the same role that the black surface of the tintype plays. Now the neat thing about amber types is that there's no rule that says you have to make them on clear glass. 
you can, for instance, make an amber type on black glass. Now, a black glass amber type looks very much like a tin type. However, it has more of a heft to it, obviously, because it's thick black glass, and it's generally going to give you a little bit deeper blacks. So, personally, I don't shoot a lot of these because they're a little bit tricky. Black glass is a little bit expensive, but it's a nice piece for special occasions. You can also make amber types on colored glass. So, for instance, here is a Christmas-themed image that I made on a red glass plate. Basically, any glass surface that you can make smooth enough to get the collodion to adhere to, you can make an amber type on. Now, there is a final type of collodion image, which is less popular nowadays, um, and that is the glass negative. Now, if we hold up a negative next to an amber type, you can see that the negative is much darker. A negative is very similar to an amber type or a tin type, but it's exposed a little bit longer and it's developed for much longer, which creates a very thick layer of silver on the glass plate. This gives you enough density that while it's not especially useful for direct viewing, you can print from it uh, using processes like salt or platinum printing, which require a lot of density from the negative. Now, those are basically the types of collodion images. There are some other variants that I'm probably forgetting about or haven't heard about because people shoot collodion on all kinds of interesting surfaces and using all kinds of interesting techniques. Um, in fact, wet plate images don't even have to be made on plates. Um, there are people who make collodion images on lunch boxes or rocks. Anything you can pour collodion on that won't melt, you can potentially make a collodion image out of. These are just the most common. So let's take a quick look at how collodion photos are made. The entire process starts with, as the name suggests, collodion. This is a liquid made of primarily ether and alcohol. It has nitrocellulose in it as well, which is what gives it kind of its stickiness and helps it to dry out and to attack your surface. And collodion used for photography purposes also has metal salts added, which are what react with the silver nitrate bath that we'll use later to create a light sensitive film on the surface of the plate. So to give a very brief overview of the process, the way you create a collodion, pro a collodion photo is you take collodion, you pour it onto a substrate such as this aluminum plate, you roll the collodion around the edges of the plate to coat the entire surface. You pour the collodion off back into the bottle. Once the plate dries a little bit, the collodion on the surface will change from a flowing liquid to sort of a tacky, syrupy substance. Once it gets well enough dried, we submerge it in a bath of silver nitrate. The silver reacts with the metal salts in the collodion and when the plate comes out of the silver bath a couple of minutes later, what you have is a light sensitive film on the surface of your plate. Now this light sensitive plate, of course, can only be handled in the dark room. We take it out, we load it into a plate holder or a, uh, a pl plate holder or directly into a camera if you're using a pinhole camera or a 35 millimeter camera or some other camera that doesn't use plate holders. And once that is sealed up light tight, we can take the camera out into the world and take a photograph. We can't take it very far out into the world though because the plate will dry out in about 10 to 15 minutes. And if the plate dries, we will not be able to develop an image on it. So the wet plate process has to be conducted fairly quickly. Um, it can either be done in a studio with a dark room or if you're shooting out in the field, you can use a portable dark box to carry out the light sensitive parts of the process in a dim environment. Now, once the plate has been exposed, it's brought back into the dark room or dark box. At that point, you're gonna take the plate out, pour developer on it, which is gonna bring the image out on the surface. However, the plate still has those light sensitive silver halides on the surface as well. So after developing and washing the developer off, the plate is then submerged in a fixer. Now the fixer can be 
one of several different types of chemical. Um, you can use sodium theosulfate, which is, of course, the hypofixer that you are probably familiar with if you've ever developed film. You can also use ammonium theosulfate, uh, which is rapid fix. It's what products like Ilford Rapid Fix is based on, and it will clear your image a little bit quicker. You can also use potassium cyanide, which had some use historically. Some people still use it today. I recommend against it because obviously it is a very dangerous chemical. If it gets into your bloodstream, it can kill you. And if it accidentally mixes with any kind of acid, it can also produce, uh, can produce cyanide gas, which obviously can kill you as well. So I personally like to use ammonium theosulfate uh, or rapid fix. Some people like sodium theosulfate. I recommend using one of the two of them. If I absolutely can't dissuade you from being from using cyanide, please be careful with it. After fixing the plate, the image comes out, if you're shooting a positive, in immediate, in immediate viewability, right? So the fixer takes you from a kind of obscured image on the developed plate to a clear, ready-to-view image on a tin type or amber type or to your negative coming out if you're developing a negative. The, the fixer then needs to be washed thoroughly out of the plate because the fixer's job is to remove the unexposed silver halides from the plate, but if it stays in there long enough, it will also begin to remove the rest of the silver and destroy your image. So after fixing, the plate is now light safe. Sorry, it was actually light safe after developing. After developing and fixing, the completely light safe plate can be taken out and then it should be put into a wash of running water. The amount of time you need to wash for depends on the fixer that you use. So sodium theosulfate takes the longest rinse times, ammonium theosulfate a little bit quicker. Cyanide fixed plates actually rinse very quickly, which I think is why a lot of people like to use it shooting in the field. But there are other methods you can use to bring your plate home and rinse it thoroughly later, which I recommend using over cyanide. Once the plate has been thoroughly rinsed, it's removed from the rinse, dried off either by drying, air drying on a rack or by force drying using a, a lamp or a candle or even some kind of an electric warmer. And then once the plate is dry, the final step is to apply a layer of varnish. Typically, varnishes are based on either sandarac or shellac. Personally, I like to use sandarac varnish. Um, they each have their pros and cons. And what the varnish does is it puts this very shiny, glossy layer on the top of the plate. And in addition to creating the signature look of the tin type or amber type or negative, the varnish will also protect the silver layer on the plate from tarnishing and also to a certain extent from you know mechanical abrasion from things that it may encounter over the course of its life and i mean this plate is very very old it's still in very good condition so a good layer of varnish will protect your plate for a very long time to come once the varnish is applied the plate can be finally dried the varnish is given a little bit of time to cure, and then the plate is complete. Now, that was kind of a whirlwind tour of the process. So, what comes next is a step-by-step -step instructional guide to making your own wet plate images. In the following weeks, we will, first of all, take a look at some basic safety precautions that you should take. Then, we're going to look at the equipment that you'll need to buy as well as the equipment that you don't necessarily need to buy, uh, because part of this discussion is what things you can do yourself or make do using other common household or photographic items. Then we'll talk about the chemistry that you absolutely need, chemistry that you may not need but may be helpful. And then we'll start looking at the process itself. Uh, we'll do a video each on how to pour a plate, how to develop a plate, how to fix a plate, and finally, how to varnish a plate. Now, after all that's done, we'll talk a little bit about some of the places that you can go from there. 
So we'll start out by pouring tin types. From there, you can work on expanding into potentially amber types, as well as glass negatives and other types of Collodion images. Once you get the basic steps of the process down, the sky really is the limit. Um, there's a little bit of manual dexterity that you have to learn at the beginning, but once that's done, there's really not a whole lot of barrier to branching out into all the different types of clothing images. And sticking to, say, tin types or amber types can be a lot of fun. It can be a, a great routine to get into, but I do recommend at some point trying to expand your, your knowledge and your practice if only for the sake of the fun of trying something new. So, with all that, um, I will leave you now. And until next time, thanks for watching.